All right, Craig, listen up. You're now Creative Commons. Everyone can touch you. Be careful. Yep. Everyone can touch you. <laughs> so yeah, uh, do, do, do with that what you will. <laughs> so I'm Grumpy Dungeon Master Christopher. That's Grumpy Dungeon Master Jay. This is now the Creative Commons Craig. CCC for short. Yep. Um, so uh, we, we won. won. We won. We won. And they lost. And then they don't, laid off a thousand people. Yeah. And, and don't let them tell you that we both won. Because that's not true. No, we won. Not um, them. We. All of us. So, so for at least the next six months, the OGL drama is over. Until they do something else super stupid uh, about it. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, they've abandoned all plans to, to publish a VTT policy. Uh, they decided to release all of SRD 5.1, uh, which is pretty much all of the rules, the, the basic rules of D&D. All that, sorry, all the basic rules of D&D 5th edition are now in the Creative Commons space. Which is a very questionable space. I don't know much about it, other than that if someone has something in Creative Commons, anyone can use it. But even that's then, how, that's how I understand it. But I'm, yeah, I'm, but even then, there's like a series of like legal issues and things that could come up as problems and whatnot. There's a lot of topics on that. Do your own research on that. I don't know my, that much, but I know that it pretty much means that everything that's the base rules of D&D, the basic rules, is now free for anyone to use. And then on top of that, they're not revoking the OGL 1.0a. And they're making it, and they're going off with a stance that it's irrevocable. Um, essentially, I didn't feel like they were going to back down, they being Hasbro, were going to back down at all on this. I'm very surprised that they did. Uh, what was it? It was reported that, uh, that Paizo sold... Eight months oh, yeah. worth oh, no. of projected So in, uh, in, in, the cor- in the course of this OGL thing, in the course of this one month, they have sold eight months, eight months worth of merchandise in the so, course yeah. of yeah, two or three weeks. Uh, th- they are completely sold out of the core rule books. Uh, at least the hardcover ones, completely fucking sold out. Amazon doesn't have them. I looked at eBay, you know, and obviously they have nothing to do with eBay, but even eBay only has a handful listed, and most of them are like the special edition ones, which are like 200 bucks. Hmm. Uh, like they've sold in the past, you know, three weeks or so on eBay, they've just completely fucking sold out of copies. Yeah, which is which is good news for Paizo. I mean, a lot of people like really just you know like they dropped the ball so big that they were like, all right, we're just going to leave Five E goodbye forever and yep, hello Pathfinder. Um, I mean, I I hope people that you know if they if they do enjoy Pathfinder that they enjoy it. I'm still ever reluctant to ever try it. I was looking at um a list of like uh just a meme of like changes that. Some people like went from 5.5, they used to play 3.5, and like, oh, now we're playing Pathfinder 2e, and all this stuff is back. Let flight footed AC and critting in a 19 and three times crit damage, and I a list seen, of other things. I haven't and seen like, the crit damage things that I don't know who's throwing that shit out there, but. right? But I, I was just looking at all that, I was like, man, it just seems obscenely complicated. I'm gonna read back to my advanced 5e books, and yeah. go ahead. I mean, advanced 5e is a, it's a good system. Uh, if you don't want the crunchiness of the rules from Pathfinder, then then play Advanced Five E because it's better than Standard Five E. Yeah, it depends. It's um, still it's the same rule system. They just give you better, st- like more stuff. You know. Well, I mean, so I've been reading through like the treasures, um, and they took like every single magic item from the DMG. Yep. Um, except and for except for anything that would have been, you know, strictly uh, copyright. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, a handful of them. So they took all the stuff from the 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 magic items, and they kind of added more fluff to them. And so, like for example, like the Berserker's Axe, which is you know it's the same Berserker Axe as it would be 
in normal fifth edition, but they added like components that would that you would need to acquire to make it. What and... crafting rules? <gasps> So like like that's that's okay. That adds flavor without adding complexity. So like I'm fine with stuff like that. And I did pretty much just spend all day today kind of going through to kind of like give my players some magic items because I remembered that Waterdeep Dragon Heist really only gives you one magic item the entire campaign, and that's a necklace of fireballs. And... Oh my god. So it gives you one item and it's a fucking necklace of fireballs. Yeah, well, player two magic two magic items that you get throughout uh well I, maybe there's others but i can't really remember uh but there's two major magic items that you get you get a necklace of fireballs at like level three the and fuck? i know and you get the stone of galore which is an aboleth trapped inside of a gem and it has a bunch of magic magical components and magical yeah, that, traits I, to that one it. i that one i don't have issue with because it's it sounds like storytelling or, or tied in somehow to some storyline yeah but a necklace of fireball at level three g- good luck but the one beat is used so oh well, i mean it's got seven more uh, yeah, you, you're, yeah that campaign's about to take a fucking wild turn <laughs> it does i mean that's just pretty much water deep dragon hives in, in a nutshell um, and I was basically like, hey, yeah, we're not doing that this time. It's smart. Uh, but like my, my campaign for Waterdeep is more homebrew now than it is anything else, you know. So yep. I, I wanted to add a little bit of flair to the items that they were getting. And I'm looking for like, OK, well, they're going into cultist areas and they're trying to find cult related items. So what are kind of like culty magic items? And I don't like giving out items that have like curses and whatnot, but I like items that have a negative effect attached to them, especially since they're like, you know, would be based off of like fiends or whatnot. So they still have a positive, but in using it for the massive positive, there's a small negative that happens with it, you know, those kind of things. And I was, I, I, I thought of a couple myself, um, but I, I just didn't like them. Yeah. I made things up and I didn't like them. So I was looking just for more inspiration and I found a couple things and, I have some ideas on what I could run with. Um, but not to get too off the point, the, the getting back to the OGL, um, I am very excited that all that stuff is now in the SRD and people are in the Creative Commons and people can use it. And the OGL is standing firm for who knows how long. One thing I did notice, um, a couple of people actually went through and, and read through the SRD probably for the first time ever. Um, I know I've never read through the SRD. Have you read through the SRD? No, of course not. Why would I? So there's a couple things that people found on there. Um, There, I guess by just putting this out in in the Creative Commons, it becomes free to anyone to use. All right. So there's a section in there that mentions it that mentions um, aberrations. Yeah, I I saw I, I saw the the article or the reddit thread or whatever Mm -hmm. the fuck it was you had linked about this but go ahead go ahead so the aberrations basically are abolisk beholders mind flayers and the slotty those are the examples that they provide um as the quintessential aberrations so now the terms abolisk beholders mind flayers and slotty um are in creative commons question mark like, yeah, I, I would I, say I am, question mark for sure. Like, I'm fully fine with, like, Beholders, the giant floating eye monster with eye tentacles. The 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 the, the very classic D&D monster that Gygax created. And, into a lesser extent, the Mind Flayers, as we all know them, to, to remain wizards' intellectual property without, yeah. you know, people infringing upon that. Yeah, I, I have no issue with that at all. I have no issue with that. That's theirs. I felt kind of weird when they made the squid head creatures on Hero Forge and then Wizards gave Hero Forge the cease and desist for making squid headed monsters. You know? Uh, so I'd have, like, I would have to see them. They, they were more mind flayers than squid head figures. They didn't have like the tail with the fins. Um, so they resemble more mind flayers than a squid headed creature. Um, but I know that there's uh, a comic out there called Ma- the Magnificent Mind Reaver, and it's all about a mind flayer, essentially. Actually, 
who goes through and adopts a child and teaches her how to become a mind reaver and you know do mind flare related things and how to eat people's brains well that doesn't actually happen he's actually a good guy he actually does good things for people it's a very fantastic comic it's called how to be a mind reaver it's a it's very cute. They're coming out with a with our own supplement here very soon. So this sound this sounds like a really awful comic. You, oh no, it's great actually. No, like a mind flayer adopting a kid. First off, that's a really dumb fucking premise. That child is food. <laughs> Se- yeah, secondly, you have if it, to read the comic. Just, just, just assuming that it did adopt this child and not eat it. I mean, it it should be teaching it to eat, you know, human brain or something or other. But I, I don't know. I I, I don't I can't, honestly I can't even imagine. That would ever happen. Like, how does a mind flayer adopt a human child? They might he not res- teach. He rescued her in, a, in one of his dungeons. And then they. And, and, and never mind. I'm. I'm just. I'm done. It, it's. It's a very <laughs> cute comic. Uh, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, what, what was so, it called again? How to be a mind reaver. There you go. For anyone who's really interested in seeing what mind flayers don't actually do. <laughs> But I'm just I'm surprised that guy never got a cease and desist. Maybe because he's foreign in a different country. Maybe they couldn't touch him. Probably. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I, was um, very, I was always kind of curious why there was never a lawsuit over the first Final Fantasy game. Uh, maybe also because it's from, you know, uh, a foreign yeah, country and they just yeah, couldn't do anything about it. Yep. Um, but there's also a couple other things that get mentioned in the SRD, like Strahd is mentioned by name. But he's more of a in reference to, like they say, for you know, uh, I think the the comment was, um, let's see if we can find it here real quick. No, um, then pretty much it just mentions like, uh, you know, big villains like Strahd, and yeah, yeah. they just kind of dropped his name. They also dropped the names of Waterdeep and Baldur's Gate as major cities. I'm like, I don't think that gives people the right to use those names. Yeah, but and it that's, could it could result in a legal battle. I would just advise people not to use those. Obviously, let let Wizard keep their IP. <laughs> yeah, they, don't, they did us a solid. Don't be dicks. Yep. Like I, you know, I, I'm I'm going to continue to not trust Watsy by any means, which I haven't for years anyway. Uh, but hey, look, you know, they they did the right thing finally. After you know, it could they could have saved themselves forty thousand subscriptions. Uh, let's be honest, yeah. but they decided not go that route. Uh, now they're doing their best to just be done with the whole fucking thing and make up for it. So get, give them at least that courtesy. I honestly believe that everything was when people started boycotting the movie. That's yeah, that was kind of went yeah. to the full, full regard. And they're banking on that movie being super successful. And if it's not, I think they're going to be in super trouble. So. Yeah, seems likely. Uh, yeah. Or at the very least, because I know there's a Dungeons & Dragons show that's supposed to be coming out. I know we've talked about it briefly. Uh, I don't know. It, like, I don't know that anyone really knows anything uh, other than, is it is it Amazon? No, uh, I don't know. It's it's one of those big platforms that's supposed to be coming out on. So I'm, I'm willing to bet they are expecting good returns on the D&D movie to keep their IP moving forward in Hollywood. Yeah. I've also seen a lot of like pre-critic pre-critic like reviews of the film. Mm-hmm. Um and these come from critics I guess that got like an early showing of the film, you know, before it was said and done, yeah. that kind of thing. And they've been panning the movie already as well too. As um, as bad They've been panning it as bad, and the common thread amongst all the things that they're panning is that this is not Game of Thrones. It's more like Guardians of the Galaxy. Well, that's actually... Well, first off, I never ever seem to agree with the critics. Uh, like, right. it's, it's very rare. And so them not liking it is good, too. If they're saying it's like Guardians of the Galaxy, that's a good thing. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was going to say. Is like, yeah... If anyone thinks Dungeons and Dragons is Game of Thrones, they're playing the wrong game. Yeah, I've I've played D and D for over thirty years, and I've never had a Game of Thrones esque style game. But I've had a lot of Guardians of the Galaxy style ones. 
it, it's we got to put together a team of extraordinary people <laughs> who just want to kill each other, and they're going to go accomplish a quest and save the galaxy. That is a, that's a, a, absolutely the way the, the movie's going to be. That's the way it should be. If I got a three-hour long epic political satire slash Game of Thrones style epic, I would probably shoot myself in the face. Just yeah. the popcorn bucket, blam, trap, popcorn shrapnel everywhere. And it would just, it'd be the worst experience I, ever. I feel that you can do that, but you sure as shit can't do that early in the IP. This, like in the beginning, you just need fun, light movies to make people enjoy themselves. Uh, you know, you I don't... think, I think like if they wanted to have a serious drama movie, they would need to pick one character and, and probably in this case, Dritz no, and God then no. have a, and ha- well, in this case, this example, Dritz, Better and then options. focus and focus on him as just a singular character going through his life and getting out of his circumstance. And that could be a drama. But beyond that, I don't, I, I, I don't feel like you could adapt any of the, the, the adventures or modules without becoming very boring and stale. Like half the yeah. fun of D and D or any tabletop really is that randomness that can happen, you know, in the game. I want to lick a cobalt. Okay. That's why AI DMs will probably never work until no. they become like, you know, replacing everybody. I think AI DMs will be fine for people who want to play it as a video game, but for people who want to play actual Dungeons and Dragons, that ain't gonna work. Because sometimes yeah. I sometimes I do just want to lick a kobold. Like, you know, you never know what players are going to do. Sometimes you just lick a kobold. Yeah, sometimes I want to fight three kobolds in a trench coat. They win, though. Usually, yeah. I've seen their stats. So how's your uh, second edition slash Exodus to Pathfinder going? Uh, second ed, I made another character for one of my players last night. We're supposed to run Ravenloft next weekend if everybody's available. And then I'm going to run second ed the weekend after that. So basically two more weeks and then I'll kick that off. And we'll see how long it goes. I may run one session and be like, fuck this, I'm going to Pathfinder. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, you know, you know me. It, I I'm ADD, and my interests change very quickly. Uh, you know, there have been lots of other games I'd planned on running that I ended up dropping. Uh, I've continued D and D very consistently because you know it's easy to run, and I had good campaign for a long time. But now that players' work schedules have changed, I'm kind of floundering. Uh, I met a couple other D and D players the other day. So I might invite them in and just start up some other campaigns and drop a couple of people. We'll just have to see what happens. Hmm. Yeah, I know. I know I might actually have to mix up my regular play group because of work schedules and stuff. And I actually DM for someone other than the same five people for the last yeah. 20 years. Yeah, and it, well, it's been yeah six or seven years at least I've, I've been DMing for more or less the same group. Um, you, you need to come over to my world and just name new people every single week. Well, I used to do that. Uh, not even really that long ago. Uh, five or six years ago, there was a local comic and gaming shop that I used to go to. That's where I met all of my current players at. Uh, several of them that were, were the owners of the shop, and some of them were just people who'd show up and play. And I would just go up there, and we'd, I'd run D&D every week, every other week. And whoever showed up, showed up, and I'd just run stuff. That's how the whole uh, Hobtown game sort of got rolling. I just needed random adventures every week, and that's what we would do. Yeah, there have been a couple calls um, on our, in the Charleston area, Facebook groups and stuff for people to start, like, just having random one-shot tabletop RPG sessions at local game stores. And it really, honestly... There's a lot of people out there who are just like, I want to run a game. I want to see play a game. I want to play a game. Just you honestly have to put it out there like, hey, I'm playing this game at this time. And yeah. then when people yeah. show up, you do it. I can't I can't express how disheartening it is to like say, hey, I'm going to be running a game at this time at this store. Come play if you want to. And then having nobody show up. Yeah, it, it happens. sucks. But it happens so often now 
But I'm just like, I don't care if it doesn't happen. In fact, I don't want it to happen. I don't want to talk to anybody. Yeah, but so at the I same at the same time, running during the week is a lot harder. If you well, if you decided to do that on a Friday or Saturday, you'd be it was much Sunday more, or it was Sunday. Normally, the day I do that. Okay, well Sunday. Still, no one shows up. Okay, so, well that's all that that's on them. That's a fair point. Yeah. So like, there's a lot of people who want to do a lot of things. So, you know, like like even this other these other people you found who want to play the game, probably half of them won't show up. We had to cancel our first in person D and D game that Shelly was going to start running. Um, my wife this this sunday because we both came down with like a chest cold yeah. and you know we didn't want to spread it to our friends we just canceled the game and delayed it till next week we asked them it's like hey you're gonna be watching the super bowl and everybody laughed so we're like yeah we'll play D D instead is there is the super bowl this weekend next weekend oh okay i royal I, rumble I, was this weekend i know I, I watched mo- i watched most of royal rumble earlier but it's like five hours it's a lot to sit through in one day well, it's only four hours of matches, one hour of... Yeah. yeah. They do the thing AEW does now, where they interview everyone post-match behind uh, the bench. Have it, no, honestly, they didn't really do that. Um, they like they I, did. I, I had to sit there and watch the whole fucking thing. Oh, well, okay. I sat here and watched everything up through the Women's Royal Rumble, and I didn't see any post-interview matches. But it is well, no, still... No, it's, it's Roman Reigns versus KO. Yeah, I haven't gotten minutes. to that, so... It lasts 30 minutes, and then it's over. And then the remaining time, nearly two hours, okay, is this press release that they do. Got it. Ugh. Well, there, yeah. Anyway, getting away from rest, like fucking, <laughs> has nothing to do with D and D. What were we even just talking about? We're talking about half, after you finish a game, oh, you'll sit around with your players and talk to them for an additional hour. I mean, you know, before they get out of your house. You, you're not wrong. Uh. We, unfortunately, for the longest time, had been doing that in the opposite direction, where we talk for two hours before game, and, <laughs> and then everybody just sort of leaves right after game's over. But it means that game is not starting at five or six. Instead, it's starting at like eight. It, you know, we get like three hours of playtime if we're lucky. Yeah. And God, I, I, I love hanging out with my friends, but man, when I'm, when I'm there to game, I want to I get it started. Don't be late, people. <laughs> Why are we rolling dice? Yep. So, what game did you run this weekend? Uh I did not. There was no tabletop this weekend, unfortunately. We uh, played Frosthaven. Uh, no, we played Frosthaven on Wednesday, and then what did I do? Friday, what, the nothing was happening. Saturday, we all got together, just played a few board games, played some more D and D Trivial Pursuit, and yeah. there was a question that popped up in that that I had set aside. And then, because I wanted to look the fucking info up, because it was the most amazing thing I had ever heard. And then it got mixed back in. So I was never able to find it again. <laughs> so, so whatever I would have, whatever rabbit hole I would have gone down on this thing, just, it's gone. It's gone forever. Uh, I hope that next time I play D&D Trivial Pursuit, I get that same one. So I can remember to look it up. I was. I actually found a YouTube video about the history of, uh, like the beginnings of D and D and D. Yeah. Uh, That's quite a story. It's like three and three and a half, almost like four hours long. The video wow. was. I think I got like thirty twenty minutes into it before I just checked out of the video because it, it was like some kid made it for YouTube. Okay. So it was it was very well put together. It, not knocking the kid or his video. It just there was just too much info and names being thrown at me and right. i had to sit there and actually really pay attention to what was going on i did take away one thing from it though okay um i had no idea tsr was an acronym yes uh tactical studies uh i don't remember the last word yeah i i, I, I can't remember it either that's how much uh, it, it, I did. It just stuck with me that it was an acronym. And I forgot what it actually actually was. Yeah. Uh, hang on. I, I've got to find it now. Tactical studies rules. Yeah. Tactical rules. studies rules. That's it. That's Formed the dumbest it. name for a company ever. I'm glad they shortened it to TSR because I remember TSR. Yeah. Yep. But uh, I had who, no idea it was an acronym. Yeah. They were formed in 1973. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons was formally released in 74. And I know I also, that I know that because of Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> I 
And I also didn't know that the first white box, according to this, this, this video I was watching, the first white box came with essentially what you would call the dumb dungeon master's guide, the, the monster manual and the player's guide, even though they yes. weren't, they were similar, but they weren't. But then the box contained all the chain mail rules as well. Did it? Yes, because the original, this is the original, original white box. Yeah. Um, and it, the reason was is because the the rules that they used to run the game of like D and D first edition as 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 it stood still required you to reference all chainmail rules in order to run the game. Like initiative was the same way, yeah. and a couple other things. You had to use the tables that were in the chainmail rule box. So you got two games in one. Yeah. So rather than actually just print up another book with those rules, it's like here, here's yeah. just, here's chainmail. Here's chainmail. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I have sold a copy of Chainmail before, and I've sold a copy of the white box, minus the box, but I've sold the books, and it was the three books that you've mentioned. But there were some other books they had released during that white box era that are, uh, if you ever find them, they're worth a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, it, like, I don't know which ones, but like, you know, Mystics and Magic or some shit like that. The other just books, supplemental books for early D&D. Yeah. So it was it was it was interesting to kind of just to see that and see the beginnings and then I, then I kind of like checked out you know it's like I said I I would have to sit there and really pay attention to what was being said see the information was interesting I just couldn't pay enough attention to it I was trying to do Dungeon Twenty Three um, oh yeah oh yeah don't get me started on that one <laughs> yeah how are you doing with that by the way <laughs> did you uh, abandon man, your project already I made it seven days <laughs> I did I made it seven days and then uh. I, I ended up, I was busy on the 8th, and then I was busy on the 9th. And then at, two days later, I'm like, well, I, you know, I, I'll do it on the 3rd day. And then I didn't do it on the 3rd day. I'll do it on the 4th day. And yep, now I'm, now I am 29 days into it. I've got 7 days worth of it done. Maybe 8 days, but. Uh, so just, I, just, just, yep. just get, just get 12 done. That's one for each month. And that uh, was the best there, there will be a bunch of it getting done for sure. Well, at least there's going to be a bunch of it getting done within two weeks. Uh, I, I will never catch up. I don't think at this point, but whatever, but I'm, uh, when I go to run second ed, I'm literally going to have to just spend that Friday sit or whatever day, the day before I run it, just sitting down and, you know, making dungeon rooms. Cause that's literally what I'm running. So, yeah. At that point, I'll have to put together, you know, a good 20 rooms or so. That's why I, I like what I'm doing kind of with the uh, water deep where I'm kind of using the water deep outlines for stuff. All the dungeons are already made. I just like, import them into the VTT and just populate them with the monsters that are there. Just the story on how they got there is completely different. So, yeah, it's it's interesting, at least. Um, and they've they're coming across sections and things that they didn't do in the the original group didn't do. So it's. We're pretty much just off book now. Like, it's none of it's going to be familiar from here on out. Um, good. Homebrew. They've covered all the material okay. that. Uh, well, it's not really homebrew because I'm just taking something already published, you know. But yeah, but if it's all different stuff that nobody's ever done, then that's homebrew. That's what that is. Doesn't matter that you're running it in sort of the same setting. I guess you're running it in the town of Waterdeep. It's taking place after the previous campaign of Waterdeep. Mm -hmm. that's that's homebrew uh see people i there are two kind of mindsets on what is and what is not homebrew and some people believe that homebrew is if you make your own world and i've never been of that mindset you don't have to create your own world to do homebrew it, like if you're sitting down and you're running a you know a campaign module you know was it the water deep one originally uh like if you ran it the like you ran it the first time and you ran it pretty much by the book i'm sure it went off script a little because your players go off script a little but it was more or less by the book that's not a homebrew that's just running a module but then taking that same setting running it later in the timeline and doing completely different stuff along the way like none of that's written down for you. You have to create this. That's a homebrew game. I I understand where you come from with the def that definition of homebrew, um, but I kind of disagree. So like if 
if I if I'm trying to to, to invite people to my table, okay, um, and say, hey, I, w- I want to run a game. It's a homebrew game, and uh, you're going to be doing X Y Z. And then I read that the person wants to run it in Waterdeep. That's not homebrew to me. That's you're just running a game, your own game in Waterdeep. Yeah, maybe original, an original story of your creation, but it's not still not homebrew because homebrew to me means like it's 100, you know, your own creation. Um, with no, you're not stealing, taking anything from anybody. Like all, like Dread of the Ice Devils is not homebrew in my opinion. One hundred percent. It is one hundred percent homebrew. Uh, no, it's just, it's just it's just an original. Content it, ta- it, for it takes Dale. it takes place in the Forgotten Realms setting, but none yeah. of it's none of it's pre written. You've created all of it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I I still the homebrew term is very vague. Like I hear my homebrew items, and they're all like five items that are all exactly the same. Just the names are changed in each one. Yeah, and like I, mean, I, I guess those are homebrew items because they're brand new and unique. Yep. But, you know, the second you go, okay, I'm running a game in Waterdeep, you're just running and a Waterdeep campaign, you know? No, the, the well, the quote-unquote Waterdeep campaign is that book that you own. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, mean can, I, I can just go look up information on Waterdeep and, com- and run anything I want, and that is homebrew. Because, I, okay, so I'm using, a, I'm using the, the town, the city, but you know, maybe I use some of the NPCs, but none of that shit's written out for me. I have to create the whole story along the way. I have to create the adventures, the encounters. And maybe that's maybe that's half the problem with the word is because when I when I think of something that's homebrew, it's something that's a hundred percent original. This is my own game, you know. This is my own setting that I've created. This yeah. is my homebrew setting. If you're just running a campaign in Waterdeep, you're just running a campaign in Waterdeep. Yeah, like I, if you want if you want to call it homebrew, I'm not going to disagree to someone's face. I'm just saying, to me, I had, I had never even seen uh, this debate until over the past month or so, and then it started kind of popping up on like DM resources and uh, a couple of other groups as to what is homebrew. Uh, I was very I was very confused. I was very confused by it. Like to me and most of the people I've ever played with, homebrew is if you just make your own stories you know, your own encounters. It doesn't matter what the setting is. I mean, for me, I, I know, I know a lot of what I'm doing in, in with Waterdeep Phoenix summer is, um, homebrew. And I can, and I, I have, and will continue to tag it as homebrew. Okay. But I don't know. It doesn't feel very homebrewy to me in a lot of sense. I, I use, I'm using the term homebrew just so people know that I'm not running Waterdeep dragon heist. Yeah. You know, and that's the only only reason I'm, I'm using the term is I want you to know that it's different than Waterdeep Dragon Heist, but it's not Dragon Heist. Yep. You know, but what, but what else would you call it? You know, you have to. I don't you, know. You have, yeah. Right. You have, to use, really know. you have to use the term homebrew because that's what people understand. Yeah, but I still I still even feel kind of bad using that term because it's not I'm just running like the summer part of Dragon Heist, even though it's going out of order. And it's going out in a very different setting. It's still pretty much the same thing, but at the same time, there is a considerable amount of role play that's happening out of book. But then again, you would have to do that anyways to run the normal Waterdeep Dragon Heist. I mean, the book is the book. Is, the, the, the adventure itself is is like a mystery. You have to you're supposed to unfold. And depending on which season, there's different paths you're supposed to take. But if they get lost along the way, you have NPCs and that that you can use to to to, to, to send the players to to kind of like get back on the right track. Mm-hmm. So when I ran uh, Dragon Heist, I used Lord Never Ember, and this time I'm using Barnabas. It's just the same NPC, the same book. I didn't create either of those guys. Yeah. Um, and the but story what, is what, what, are, what but every encounter that you have with Lord Never Ember is written in that book. Um no. the, the 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 oh was it not? You just used no. it the first time around. So you homebrew used... that portion of it. Yeah, but like I said, I'm not gonna like oh this section here is the homebrew stuff and that section no, there's no, the no, 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 no. No, I'm just running this campaign. I'm running the same campaign again, though it's just like the after effects of of Waterdeep. So like I would say it's 70 30 
maybe mm-hmm. where 70 of it's from the book and 30 of it's from um, out of my head. And like I said, granted the stuff that's happening from here on out is stuff my players have never seen before. And it's stuff that a majority of players probably wouldn't have seen because the the module ends pretty much in the next two sessions if I was running the real thing. But I, I'm pretty sure we have another five before we end anything. Yeah. Um, so that last three or four sessions, you'll be making stuff up completely. Not really. I'll be using I'll be, the, the, the way they have it in the book is chapters one, two, three, and four is the campaign. Right. And then five, six, seven, eight is optional major dungeons, depending on what you did during the story. Okay. Um, you never have to go in there. And I didn't, even, I didn't do that at all for the first game. This game, I'm using one of those. So, okay. um, so, okay. I'm, yeah. So, so the way you're describing it now, okay. Yeah. It's probably more of a modified. Yeah. Game. But like I said, there's, there's no other word for that middle ground between the two. Yeah, that's. Like, I think I, that's. I think that's how you describe it when pitching it to players. I'm running a modified version of that uh, of uh, water. Yeah, but mo- Dragon Ice. most people wouldn't know what that meant unless I said it. it's a homebrew version think, of Dragon. I think Ice. people know what the version. I think people know what the word modified means. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> if they don't, they oh, there's a problem. Yeah. Uh, listen, I, I I'm I'm very familiar with the uh, the current levels of schooling here in good old U.S. of A. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. Yeah, I was I, I was going to have a whole uh, conversation on, on this podcast because a, a couple podcasts back, I was kind of jokingly saying you need better players, and I got to uh-huh. thinking about it after I'd said it because I, I am spoiled. I, I have really fucking great experienced players, and I understand mm-hmm. sometimes you play with people who just aren't into D and D and don't know shit. Uh, I currently play with two people who are brand fucking due to the game, and we're having to help them along the way. I got that. Uh, but then when you start talking about the education levels of people, that that becomes a whole other thing. You know, some people can do math, some can't. Some click with D and D, some don't. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you are going to play with people who are just there because their boyfriend is there or their girlfriend is there. Or whoever, you know, yeah. who don't give two rats ass about being there. But they're there yeah. because, you know, they just want to hang out with their friends or whatever. Yeah, I and, mean, I've had, I've not, well, hopefully not, granted, not recently, um, but I've I've had those AL sessions where I've had those players who just didn't want to be there. Yeah, I've And had were there too. because of other reasons. Yeah. Or showed up, you know, 30 minutes into the session. I want you to stop everything to teach them how to play the game so they can play. And like, have you ever played the game before? No, oh. <laughs> but I want to play now. Like I, I, I canceled my evening doctor's appointments to come to this place and play true story. So I want to play. Um, I, I can't, I'm playing with seven people right now. Yeah. You showed up late. It's not that like, easy. If you wanted a character, you had to come like an hour early so I could walk you through the basics of the game. I, I can't make you. Well, it's your fault. You ruined my evening and my child's evening. And the child's like, doesn't want to be there. So, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. And that that's the problem kind of with AL, because with Adventures League, they expect you to literally take in anybody at any time. Well, you know. it, it does state in the AL rules that they don't want you running a table of more than four people. OK, well, that's good. Yeah, that's uh, good. At, at least at, at least if you're uh, you know, like how I would do it, I just. Whoever was there that wanted to play, I'd let him in. But if somebody showed up late and didn't know how to play the fucking game, I'm, you know, it's not AL. I can do what I want. <laughs> get, get I've had fun, people show get, up without dice. I mean, but that's 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 an easy hurdle to, to, to overcome. Yeah, it, that happens. Uh, hell, I have experienced players that show up without dice. But yeah, you know, it's um, not like it's not like all of us don't have buckets full of fucking dice. Yeah, and like I use a lot of minis too, so I kind of like need people to have minis, and like. When they start start throwing like D6s up there, like that's my mini. No. 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 God no. Go Pick, get yourself a mini. Yeah. A borrow look, a mini. Yeah, go 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 buy a box of minis or you know, Lord forbid you borrow a mini from somebody that's there. Ugh. Just, I have yeah, one I have one it. reoccurring play, player in the Avengers League that um she's very young and um but she's been playing now for over a year. Now that I think about shit, it's been well over a year. Um, and she always forgets her mini every single time. 
she has bought more minis probably than I have because every week she's buying a brand new mini for her character. Why doesn't she just hand you the mini and ask if you could hold it? Oh, then I lose it. At that point, yeah, but then it, then it's not her fault. Then you have to buy her a mini. <laughs> <laughs> that's neat. I mean, yeah, that's honestly like when it comes to where we always game at the same house every week. So most of us just leave our characters over there because it's a lot easier than lugging them back and forth. Uh, I know I've lost character sheets over the years before, so I'm just like, fuck it. You guys keep it. And I do rip. have one one player back when I played fourth edition and um, he, uh, he he came over and he played. He was probably my most most consistent player. and you know, it was fourth edition times and it's been decades ago. Um, he, he left, he would leave everything at my house and he asked me if that was okay. And I'm like, yeah, I guess, I mean, it will just be here. I'm not gonna, you know, do anything with it. Um, yep. his name is Matt Castillo, 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 Matt Castillo, yeah. Castillo. He, he, he still lives in Virginia. I don't know if he listens to the podcast at all, but if he does, now he can actually, you know, I shouted him out and he needs to respond back. I still have your dice, by the way. I know I'm like three states away from you now, and it's been like over a decade since I last had any kind of conversation with you. But Matt, I still got your bag of fire dice. In fact, I've already given them to my daughter, so I'm sorry. <laughs> so you actually do not have them anymore. They belong <laughs> to somebody else. They are hers by right of giving. <laughs> but like... I, I have I have a couple of minis and stuff like that too, but it, that just seems to happen, you know. Yeah, yeah. I've ended um, up with books and dice and everything just over the years that weren't mine. It, I bought my wife a player's handbook, and she's like, "Oh, so and so is playing with us now regularly. She wants she wants to borrow the player's handbook. Okay, I'm just gonna let her borrow mine. And I'll get it back from her." And I was like, "Sweetie, if you give her the player's handbook, you will never get it back." She's like, what are you talking about? Of course I will. She's very nice. She's not going to take it from us. Like, I'm, I'm not saying she's going to steal it. I'm just saying, is you give her this book, you are never getting it back. And it's not against her at all as a person. She's not stealing it or keeping it or whatever. You're just never going to get it back. Yep. He's like, I'll get it back. Well, guess what? We never got it back. Yeah, you know? I, I, that's exactly how I lost my 3.5 DMs guide. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't, let, I don't let friends borrow movies when DVDs were a thing. Um, if I lent a movie to a friend, I just gave them the DVD and never expected to get it, give it back. You know? Yeah. And, like, there, there are some movies that I liked a lot, but I knew I'd never watch them again or whatever. It's like, yeah, just go ahead and take it. I don't, I don't need it back. And it's, it's, it's not like, you know, it's, it's not like the friends are being malicious or anything. It just, yeah. that's just how brains work. It seems. So I, you, I loaned out a DVD a couple of days ago and I got it back yesterday. So you're lucky. Uh, it's, I, I loaned it out to somebody who I trust, who is very responsible. Uh, yeah, but I have absolutely loaned out DVDs and video games and all sorts of other shit. Never seen it again. And like I was, I like if my wife would have said, "Hey, we don't need two players' handbook. I'm just going to give this to her." I would have been like, "Okay, sure. I don't. We don't need. We don't need to. It, it's 15 bucks on Amazon. We'll buy another one. It's not that big yeah. a deal." In fact, she already has another replacement. I bought her. Yeah, you can her probably own. get You can probably get them real cheap right now on eBay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, I mean, just and I've done that too, where I've just bought and people. Oh, I really kind of want that. You got it. Can I borrow your copy? No, it's just you want to buy you this one. It'd be easier. You don't have to touch my copy at all. So, wow. Okay. Um, you know, players handbooks on eBay are about thirty bucks. Is the cheapest I'm seeing them. They're cheaper on Amazon. Yeah, that's weird. They go on sale all the time for like twenty bucks. <laughs> um, so I actually did. Like I said, I did actually buy my wife the uh, collector's edition DMG players handbook and monster manual mm -hmm. because she's going to start running games in person now, and she's the DM. And she came out and she showed me her. DMs DMs guide and her monster manual guide and I had like all these nice little pretty post-it note tags all throughout like the book. Yeah. You know, the tag and quick reference different things. And I was like, aw. Welcome to the club. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how some of mine used to look. 
Yeah. My I, I, my DM's guide has one very specific tag in one place. That's the only one that I ever use, and that's the to find the the, the treasure chart tables quickly, and that's it. That's a good one to have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's the only of, one I ever seem to need. Yeah. None of, none of mine actually have uh, tags on them anymore. But I, I don't know. I've just gotten. I know those books just inside and out so easily. Um, Pathfinder, yeah. Uh, yeah, Pathfinder. I might need something like that, especially for like you're talking about magic item tables and stuff. So tell me, without looking it up, what's the very oh, rule for cleaving? I, I can't tell. Well, for cleaving, is that even yeah. a thing? Is that a thing in Fifth Edition? You said you know the book inside and out. You tell I, me. No, I know the locations of things. If I need, uh-huh. to, I can just open up the book and get right there to where I need within a you know couple of seconds. All right. Well, here let's do let's do a quick science experiment. You got your book handy? No, it's on the fucking bookshelf. I don't even play Five E anymore. Oh, well, I, I, let me rephrase. I don't run Five E anymore. I'll still play. So if anybody's local and wants to run a game, just let me know. Yeah, there there is a variant rule for cleaving. It's it's yeah. fun. Oh, is there a variant rule? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't even know what book that would be in. It's in it's in the DMG. Okay. Uh, it says when you strike at any uh, you, you can strike many adjacent foes with a single blow you can make an attack against the foe within reach that cleaves into other flows if you hit you deal damage normally and can make an additional attack as a bonus action against the foe that is adjacent to the previous foe that is also within reach yeah that's basically what cleave did in third edition except it was not a bonus action it was just part of your uh full attack action and if you had great cleave you could then take a five foot step if you so basically, if you killed a target, you could then cleave. And if you killed a target, you could great cleave and take a five-foot step. And so long as you could take a five-foot step and kill something, you could keep going infinitely. And the one that I'm more aware of, maybe the, maybe the other one was wrong. Cleaving through creatures. If your player character regular fights hordes of lower-level monsters, consider using this optional rule to help speed up such fights. When a melee attack reduces an undamaged creature to zero hit points... Any excess damage from that attack might carry over to another creature nearby. The attacking the attacker targets another creature within reach, and if the original attack roll can hit, it applies any remaining damage to it. If that creature was undamaged and likewise reduces zero hit points, repeat this process, carrying over any remaining damage until there are no valid targets or until the damage carried over falls, fails to reduce an undamaged creature to zero hit points. That's the one I'm familiar with. Yeah. It's okay, terrible. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a weird fucking variant of cleave. It it kind of makes sense. So like if you if you have a giant two handed weapon and you swing at a CR one eighth goblin and you hit it for thirty damage, okay, you take seven off the thirty, you have twenty three remaining. So then you go to the next goblin, and take off seven. It's like sleep. Yeah, it's not that it doesn't. Attack. It's not that it doesn't make sense. It's just. It's a it's a very different version of cleave that I've yeah. never heard. Yeah, it's it's weird. Yep, it's kind of like the massive damage variant rule. Yeah, it's just a, it's a strange version of cleave. Never seen it. Have you ever used the massive damage variant rule? Uh, no, I definitely haven't. I mean, I've I've used massive damage before, but not often. That's one of those things uh, that's just. Rare. So when a creature takes damage from a single source equal to or greater than half of its maximum hit points, it must succeed, must succeed a DC 15 con save or suffer a random effect determined by the system shock table below. System and, shock. Wow, that's fucking second edition right there. <laughs> so, um, so like if you're a creature, if you're a 30 hit point creature who takes 15 damage from a single source. You roll a con save. If you fail, then you roll a d10 as the DM. On a 1, the creature drops to 0 hit points. On a 2 to 3, the creature drops to 0 hit points, but it's stable. On 4 to 5, it's stunned until the end of its next turn. On a 6 and 7, the creature can't take reactions and has disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks until the end of its next turn. On an 8 through 10, the creature can't take reactions until the end of its next turn. It's very brutal. And does not work for low level D and D play at all. So don't ever use that rule because, or, or do use it and actually make it challenging. No, because when you have eight hit points and someone swings at you with an, 
1d6 plus 2 damage weapon, it's going to always cause a system shock. Yes. And you're going to die. Yes. No. It's a little too brutal. Around like... You realize who you're talking to. The guy who's about to run a fucking second ed dungeon crawl. <laughs> like, I think I think the massive damage, like, if you're, like, level 15 adventurers, and your barbarian has, like, 300-something hit points or some shit, okay? Then it's and, fucking pointless, because you're never going to take 150 And he takes attack. 150 damage? That's rare. Rewards a monster. Give him... Make him roll a con save. He's going to pass. He's level yeah, 15. There are, there are no monsters that do 150 damage in the game in one attack. A giant throwing a boulder on somebody. No, it doesn't. Without I know. using I've, throw boulder I've, ability. I've, I've, hit, I've hit characters recently with boulders from giants. It doesn't do anywhere near that much. Speaking of doing a lot of damage to things, and the one topic that I needed to cover this, this adventure, I effed up royally in my stream game this weekend. Right. You wouldn't know because you didn't watch. That's right. I was not home. Excuses. I'm never home, home on weekends. You know this. Don't you have phones? Yeah. It's being used for other stuff. Whatever. I'd support so, your stream. I don't have a stream other than your stream. <laughs> Anyways. Um, I had a story element that I revealed a day too early. So the t in my story, the time things, the days that, that things take place are very specific to needed events. All right. And I revealed something that would have happened at midnight to the players before midnight actually had actually had happened. Okay. Now, we kind of joke, joked at each other and kind of pointed. I told him to forget about it until he came back the next day and he, he brought it up again. Um, but it was still a major mess up on my on my end. Um, essentially, I had an NPC basically be very discouraged that a bunch of commoners had died to the use of uh, a poison wine bottle. And they were unable to find the perpetrators and like 10 plus people had died. And they died to a poison called Midnight Tears, which does 9d6, if I remember correctly. Poison damage. Half as much on, on, field safe. On common, every one of those commoners would have to make a fucking uh, system shock check. No, they just die because oh, I, I, know. I, I, don't, I don't think even if you'd have to roll ones on every single die of the 90s. It, it, would, it would still kill them. Commoners, have, then, like, commoners have like four hit points or some shit. Right, and then it, well, they don't have to save, and that would, would be four, and then you know they just be unconscious. I guess I don't know. Maybe, no, they would be dead. Some, yeah, make a system shock. <laughs> it does save. They drops to zero hit points. They're dead. But here's the thing: is I messed up. We poked fun at me for messing up, and so we kind of just went along with it. Um, you know, even good experienced DMs mess up sometimes. Oh yeah, it happens. I I had to immediately admit that I messed up and told and told everyone just to forget about it because there was no way I could have just rolled with it. Yeah. I, I I revealed that what happened six hours too early. So everybody was cool with it. Now, I want to tell the backstory to the to that poison and why everybody was poisoned and the almost other fuck up that would have happened. So, um. Part of what I've been doing is I've been pulling a lot of stuff from uh, Baldur's Gate sent into Avernus and kind of like co-mingling it in with Waterdeep Fiendish Summer with the Waterdeep Dragonhive story. Okay? Yep. And so, like, when you clear out this one villa, there's nothing to be found anywhere in there except for some gold bars, you know, because the Lady of House was going to escape and take her children with her. And she had stashed away some gold in a, in a horse saddle. Um, but if you play through the Baldur's Gate game, you go through a villa as well. And in that villa, there's a ton of shit to find and steal if you're that kind of party. And I had felt bad because I haven't been really rewarding my players with much money and gold. So I wanted to incentivize them for looting some stuff. So they found the gold bars. And they found a couple other things that were worthwhile. Um, and so from the Baldur's Gate adventure, I copied over 
this one wine rack with these ruby goblets. And like each of the ruby goblets, there's like six of them, are like 75 gold a piece. Um, and then there's this wine that's like 20 uh, gold a bottle. And there's 16 bottles. Well, one of the bottles is laced with poisons because the noble family basically uses that bottle if they want to kill someone they have invited over to their house. Right, yeah, yeah. And so I figure since, like, these are the, the cult worshiping variants that it made perfect sense to, you know, have that in their house. So I had the players randomly roll for the bottles that they chose. One player chose, like, one in ten, and the other player, player like, rolled and got, like, two, six, something, and 16. And 16 was the poisoned one. I then secretly rolled that that player, uh, the first bottle that he opened and used, okay, was going to be the one with midnight tears in it, okay? Yep. So he's a tavern owner in our game. So he could have used that wine to, to service some customers in the tavern. And if you would have uncorked his first bottle, it would have been the one with midnight tears. But he also could have given it to the players and they could all have drank it and been refreshed. And I would have given them temporary hemp points or something kind of fun like that. And then at midnight, blah, they're all probably going to die. Um, yep. So I was dreading the fact that that would possibly happen to the players and derail the campaign. Hey, um, yeah, it happens. It happens. I, I, I did have a backup in place in case that happened. So the players that I know that would would do listen, I had something planned in case the party TPK'd off this midnight tears poison shit. Um, the player, however, chose to sell all the um, the wine bottles to an inn called the Flagging Dragon, who competitors I had, of his, <laughs> who are competitors of his, but they were paying twice the price for any um good tavern food stuffs or wines or 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 alcohol so part of the story like, is so it gets like is, 40 gold instead of the 20 yeah. so like part part of the story is that these that Waterdeep has pretty much all the goods that have been like funneled into the city or are, are missing and they really haven't researched that much they've just kind of been like eh, our tavern's fine why would we care um so there's all these taverns that are closing down or not having any stuff to, to give patrons and whatnot. And the flag and dragon is pretty much gouging customers and gouging suppliers to, to basically keep afloat. So he goes to the flag and dragon, he sells all the things and he gets a bunch of money and he walks away. And, um, I told him that immediately the owner that takes the bottle, he opens it up and begins pouring it out for a bunch of customers right then and there. And some of his weight staff, and he takes a swig of the bottle as well. So I had messed up by then. Later, the players went to an uh, a city watch NPC, like a cop, essentially. Yeah. And he's a captain of the dock ward, and he was distraught because a bunch of people with the flag and dragon just died mysteriously at midnight. But it wasn't that midnight had not happened yet. So yeah, that you was just, my big. You jumped the gun there. I jumped the gun there. Yeah. But now there um, has to be an investigation as to what happened. Um, well, th- th- as I told the players, th- is that the Flag and Dragon had, since they were buying pretty much everything at double price, they were doing it off book. And there's no record that, you know, of what they've been buying. Well, from no, well we have whether or not the police get involved. Yeah, you know, yeah. you're talking about shady dealings already. You're talking about you know, mob members or just uh, people who have no problem hiring assassins to come in and figure out you know, who who did this and go mm-hmm. deal with them. So they bought stuff from a competitor. Naturally, they yeah. I would think they would be kind of curious about it, but yeah, it's your game. You figure it out. I I already have things in store. Okay, good. I yeah, so you so you've store. already figured it out. I have. Um, so it, it's kind of chaotic right now, but you know, yep. Uh, hopefully, yep. I, I think they're having fun with the story. It, it's it's a lot to unpack, you know. 
So yeah. So I got, I got one last thing before we wrap this thing up. Um, I found the Pathfinder's version of the Terrask. Is it uh, Godzilla? No, no, it's 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 totally fucking different, but it's it, it's their version of the Terrask. And as the Terrask, I think I'm pretty sure he is uh, licensed by Watsi, so nobody else could really use it. Uh, they could use the name, I guess, because yeah. But if it was like the D and D Terrask, there could be lawsuits and everything. Uh, so well, there's. Can't really, I'll look at it. I'll look it up while you talk. Yeah, well, it's like, I'm talking like kind of like the Mind Flayer or the 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 Owl Bear. You know, it's one of those. Uh, so there's a creature in here called the Guthalath. I I probably fucked up the pronunciation. It is a CR 19 creature, and I'm going to read the little excerpt on the side of it. Entire civilizations have been swept off the face of Galarian due to the devastating rampage of a Guthalath. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel, for after some time the Guthalath ends its massacre in a swift yet seemingly random way, the Colossus then finds a remote location deep in the wilderness where it buries itself, entering a deep slumber for years, if not centuries, before awakening and beginning the destructive cycle once more. So it's literally the Terrasque in that form. It just wakes up every century or two, runs around, kills a whole bunch of shit, and then disappears. And what it is, it's like it's a hundred foot tall, like stone statue that mm -hmm. will it'll uproot itself from the ground and do what it does. It's got a couple of laser beams for eyes. Uh, it'll like you know shoot laser beams out of its eyes. And it has a cool ability called Deadly Throw, where it grabs a motherfucker and throws them at a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then it also has a thing called the Erosion Aura, where anything near it starts just taking damage every round. Uh, it also gets rid of resi it reduces resistances. It's kind of a cool little creature, and by little I mean huge. <laughs> and it has so a fuck. It has a trample ability. Which fucking Terras should have a trample ability. Why doesn't Terras have trample? We forgot about it. We were designing the card. Really? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So the Terras originally comes from the 13th century. It is a fearsome, legendary, dragon-like mythological hybrid from the from province in southern France. Yep. Tamed in stories about Saint Martha, such as the old, such as the one told in the Jacobus de Vorgani's Golden Legend. So yeah, Terrask is a hundred percent. That's that's what I was saying. They could, going, yeah. they could they could use the name, but I think if they made it, if they had that same backstory I just read and used the name, then there might be issues. Yeah, I mean we've talked about that before. Where Godzilla's a Terrask, and for all intents and purposes, yes, yeah, you know, and so it's just a name for a dragon that sleeps for a while, wakes up and kills things and goes back to sleep again. Yep. Sounds like my kind of guy. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, well, I, I watched, uh, uh, God damn it, the uh, Warrior Nun series on uh, Netflix a while back, and they actually have creatures in there they call the Terrasque, but they're effectively just demons that pop in from another dimension. Yeah. I guarantee that that season four of Stranger Things, uh, the Rift... I guess this is spoiler territory if you haven't seen I, the yeah, yeah, like, if, yeah. Stranger Things. But... If, if you're somehow still behind on Stranger Things, I don't know how they could be. But... I, I guarantee you that the, the rift that the Vecna opened at the end of Season 3 is going to summon the Terrasque, or they're going to reference something as the Terrasque in the, that season, and they're going to have to stop it from busting through um, from the upside down. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, you know, they I mean, they won't they won't know what it is, so they'll just call it the Terrasque because that's about right. the scariest thing in D and D. I mean, the mind flayer is not a mind flayer. Vecna, I guess, is Vecna. He's not really. He is but is it? I mean, you know, he controls like roots and weeds and shit. So, well, he, yeah, he he he's very lich like. Lich like, but, then, but has some druidic tendencies, at least in the show. I mean, nothing druidic. They're all like flesh tendrils. Well, that's that's true. Yeah, they were. Weren't it's, they? it's more like it's more like blood magic and necromancy. Yeah, okay. It's a Vecna. Yeah, plus the Vecna. Vecna is really cool. I really wish I I could get the um the hand and eye of Vecna statue. 
but uh, I missed my opportunity to buy it when it first came out in GameStop, and now it's like super expensive. Yeah, my local I... game store has the the Wand of Orcus though, and I keep looking at that thing. I'm like, I really want it. Why is it <laughs> not on your on my shelf wall. already? Because it's like two hundred and fifty dollars. Eh, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. And I got to buy the Astral Dreadnought when it comes out, and that's $250. Uh, there are no Hand or Eye of Vecna statues on eBay. It's a, it's a, it's a Hand of Vecna, and he's holding his eye, and it's in a glass dome. Huh. Well, I didn't see it on eBay. It's out there, I promise you. Oh, I, I believe you. I know, I, I know you and your collectibles, your D&D collectibles. You know your stuff. I see him at right there. I got my foot and a half tall, tall brain statue right there. I'll stick with the I'll stick with collecting old books. Pinky in the brain? My favorite statue? Uh hey, that's a good one. Yeah. Cheap brain. I, I, I need the pinky though. Yep. So I don't have the pinky. Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? I have my eye drake, my beholder dragon, got my Immortal Hulk right there. I got my Jabberwocky who's got his wings and one wing is, isn't strong enough to hold up the wings so it's been slowly falling over and like bending you, see, you, you, permanently. Yeah. You, you fail me. You fail me. I was expecting you to come back with a uh, pinkyism on how we end the podcast. And there's my Shardalian Dragon. You keep talking about all the cool stuff, all the cool collectibles. Me and Craig, we're getting out of here. And there's my statues of Thanos. I have like 17 of them all in this little 